everyone. I guess I will take my mask off too. Um, if my lipstick is smeared, pretend, you cannot tell. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. I feel like I still don't know, I don't have my elevator pitch for my book and I'm like, can you send me that later? Um, and thank you so much, Alex, for your reading. That was so wonderful to hear your work and the humor um, as well. <laughs> um, okay, this is the first in-person reading I've done for Dear Diaspora um, and in a long time. So thank you all just for being in the room and sharing the space. Um, okay. I always have a list of poems, but sometimes I go rogue, so we'll see what happens. Um, yeah, thank you again for the introduction. I guess all I really, I'll really say to preface it, um, you know, in this collection, I follow a character, Susie, Susie with an I. Um, so you'll hear some third person poems and first person poems. Um, I guess the way I see it, um, these third person poems kind of show Susie kind of maybe in a younger um, place in her life. And some of these first person poems can um, speak about into the diaspora in a, a different way. and with more distance and in a more reflective manner. Um, so I'm gonna start with the second poem in my collection. The first language. One, behind the church, we ran through labyrinths of poplar and hickory, dirt paths cutting through ravines in the backs of suburban homes, their brick patios and striped furniture. In the green light of summer, we loved getting lost how we could step into woods and exit into cul-de-sac eight blocks away. Loved it best when tadpoles formed a halo around our toes. Two, before he disappeared, my father taught me how to catch tadpoles in my hand. The trick wasn't just to stay still, but to stop breathing. He caught dozens like this, knees bent and pant legs folded, his face inches above the creek. He taught me that our first language was named after tadpoles, the way they moved through water, a knife dissecting the stratosphere, a voice cutting quiet. Three, my third favorite memory of him is walking hand in hand on two lane roads and identifying Virginia trees. In one pocket, a zodiac sign lighter, a button for mother's favorite blouse. In the other, acorns for burying. I can still identify the red oaks. Four, today the tadpoles flow through my fingers like an egg yolk, and my impulse is to cradle one in my mouth. The tadpole swims circles, and my tongue follows, mapping its movement before spinning. Susie with an eye is not afraid of the dark or the things that move in its current. She approaches school like she approaches, approaches most things, eyes narrowed, scanning the edges of sight, when she scribbles her name, she dots the eye, rubs the sharp graphite onto her finger. Before bed, she says, our father, our father, our father, our father, our father, as fast as she can. The fastest was in Sunday school. Highlighting the Virgin Mary pink, she drowned out the counselor's drone with prayer. Tonight, she turns her blinds inward. Through a tiny sliver, the moon spoils the dark. She doesn't know about the war times because her father wouldn't speak about the war times. She knows her father met a man during war times who would later introduce him to her mother. That man is now her uncle. She knows that before war times, her father was in college. He liked to camp, play volleyball. After the war times, her father and his family dried areca nuts and betel leaves to sell, to stain teeth black. When her mother biked past on the way to teach preschool, he stood in his doorway and stared. Nothing existed during the war times or before or now in its aftermath. There is only her father. He is somewhere unknown. So my collection is called Dear Diaspora. I have a few poems um, throughout, scattered throughout the collection um, titled Letter to the Diaspora. Um, the first line is Dear Diaspora, so that's kind of where the collection title came from. Um, it was kind of a placeholder at first, to be honest, because I could not think of a, a title for the collection. Sally, you may remember me, like, it was a struggle, and I just kept calling that, and I was like, you know what, this fits, so I'm gonna go with that. Um, so I have a few of these poems scattered throughout, and they started out as one longer poem, and just over time, um, you know, I took them apart and looked at them on their own, own footing. 
So this is the first one um, that appears pretty early on in the collection. Um, and the, the second line um, is crossed out, so that's what I mean when I say strike through. Letter to the Diaspora. Dear Diaspora, I believe in the American dream, strike through. Last night, I had the American dream. In the dream, I had an indoor pool. In the dream, I walked my dead dog with a diamond leash. I ate a greasy burger with my perfect hands. I had the most beautiful sex. My skin was smooth, alabaster as the moon. In the morning, everything had changed. There was no pool, only twine for drying clothes. The dead remained dead. My perfect hands held nothing. Nothing was better. Um, my next poem is called Cicada Summer. Um, I know I talked to a few folks earlier also from the East Coast, so you all know the cicadas that come out like every seven years, right? They were a big deal growing up. Um, I remember like kids in elementary school daring each other to eat them, and I don't know at this point if that's a true memory or just something that like I've said that so often that now it is a true memory. Um, cicada Summer. The cicadas come from the ground and enter the world in currents, streaming down tree trunks, over branch branches, across sidewalks and roads, the males pulsing their abdomens, singing for sex. In the field behind the school, Susie and her classmates stand still as dozens climb over their bodies, careful not to crush the winged insects beneath their feet, fearful of littering the ground with broken glass. Susie collects every wing she can find. Each one becomes a small body of water she carries in her pocket, a broken window pane she holds to each eye. She counts dozens more on her way home and imagines how they would taste. Hands in her pockets, touching the wings to each fingertip, she wonders, would they still sing on the way to death and would it sound any different? Today, she walks through uneven fields of green and spits into tall grass, the roots of trees, listens as the clicking of cicadas fills her body with song. The green lacerates her ankles, and she imagines her blood mixed with dirt will nourish, will add to the muscle tremor of the earth. Wish list. Susie plucks the occasional white hair from her mother's head and all the stiff hairs from her powdered armpit. Each dozen is worth a dime. This is her only allowance. She used to pluck her father's white hairs too, but when they spread to his sideburns and eyebrows, her mother brought, bought black hair dye from CVS. When Susie first asks for an allowance, her mother doesn't know the meaning of the word. Who pays for your food, gives you a roof to sleep under? The next day, she tells all her nail lady friends who whoop for days. And who raised her like that? <laughs> Susie adds allowance to her wish list for a bourgeois life alongside a waterbed, family vacations to Disney World, a minivan with built-in video player, Lisa Frank school supplies, fondue sets, the wooden tree swing. In a past life, mother was a preschool teacher, 5 a.m. church goer. Outside her house, grandfather cut hair. To his right was grandmother selling firework powder, air drying fish bought in Vumto, and bust back on grandmother's lap. In a past life, mother ran up and down the stairs to stoke the 10 hour fire burning under glutinous rice. After 75, she was bused to a field stepped barefoot into mug, mud, dug irrigation systems, afraid of what she might step on. When grandfather fell, no one knew the word stroke. Grandmother rubbed oil onto his hands and feet, sold MSG. In a past life, mother woke up to the sound of cyclos, notching the road. When grandmother died, mother flew back and tied white linen around her head in mourning. It was not like the first time on the plane when they served packets of peanut butter and jelly, conquered grape. I stole dozens. I did not know if I, if I would see them again. Ode to Hunger. Praise spam fried with fish sauce and sugar. 
jackfruit, 25 pounds of it, carved on newspaper, latex sap, sticking fingers, praise craft mac and cheese, small miracle of powdered cheddar, pork floss in the big Tupperware, Sarah Lee, Praise soy sauce and rice, shrimp cup noodles, three minutes till done. Praise the soft insides of baguettes, the first star fruit, pocketed and sliced. To Chef Boyardee, to durian, sweet scent of garbage. To pickled mustard greens, lean cuisine, pizza bagels after school. Praise women, infants, and children. Banana blossoms, hearts thinly sliced in vinegar, drained of all color. Um, so I have a longer, a longer poem in the middle of my collection called "The Boat People," um, and that this part, um, this poem, pulls a lot from like archival research and older newspapers, um, and also interviews I did with family members as well. Um, so it's kind of like the heart of the collection where it's placed, um, and also kind of gives context too for I think diaspora and like the diaspora I'm writing about specifically. Um, so it's a longer poem, so I probably am going to skip around in it um, and just see what happens. Um, the boat people. She Googles FOB after someone calls her fresh off the boat. She has never been on a boat. What she finds. Blank deaths from blank to blank. Blank memorials in blank countries. On open water. And they traveled on small fishing junks, origami boats, arms and legs folded, one over the other, trawlers, smuggling thousands of bodies, searching for international water, living on empty for weeks and months, looking for coastline that did not push back. Vietnamese Boat People Memorial, Asian Garden of Peaceful Eternity, Westminster Memorial Park. The man and old woman, the young mother and child, frozen in bronze, turned blue-green. Four figures so soaked, they have become the waterlogged wrinkles of their clothing. Four figures on the raft, floating in a fountain, shaped like the body of a boat, their bodies submerging above water. The young woman's outstretched hand, reaching back in time. Around the fountain lay 54 stones, each inscribed with names a small portion of the dead. The cost of leaving. 24 karat gold bars, bribery, cover of night. On the boat, people drank urine, licked their palms of sweat. The tide brought them in, human, cargo, a small island camp, swarming bodies under palm fronds and scrap metal, waiting to be screened giving birth to new life, waiting, raising fighting roosters, waiting, waiting five years. Can you die of waiting, waiting, denied asylum? Interview number one. The former boat person stated that as many as 20 ships passed by without stopping and coming to their aid, ignoring their cries for help. When they finally saw shore, the refugees sank the boat with their bodies pounding their hands and feet so they could not be towed away. The people smugglers speak. They come to us with black market gold, whole life savings, homes sold, they, the soon-to-be defectors. They will say they're going on holiday or nothing at all. They will disappear in the middle of the night, walk through mud and green jungle, reappear in darkest morning, some commissioned their own boats built, traveling petri dish of human, waste, fever dream. We know men who have tried to leave many times, only to be turned back. Bad weather, bad feeling, they will not give up. They would squander their life savings a dozen times. Anything for the chance of freedom, the promise of blue ocean. Can you define a refugee? A refugee seeks refuge. Interview number six. I did not want to go back. When they took us to the plane, it was over very quick. We owned almost nothing still after seven years. The men brought their fists together, desperate. We dragged our feet, refused to walk. There were bodies against their barricade. were met with water cannon. 
The men were rolled into blankets, loaded into the cabin like a cigarette in the plane's mouth, a stilled bullet. I'm gonna read um, another letter to the diaspora. Um, I think it's the last one that appears in the book. Um, letter to the diaspora. Dear diaspora, ecstasy moves through the body quickly in short quips and yelps, leaves its aftermath on my tongue. The question, how to slow it down? Grief becomes a body of water, asks, where are your cloves of garlic, your sliced bird's eye chili? The body of water wants to be named, is only a girl. Ecstasy demands more, taste buds adjusting to the taste of hunger, my body risking itself. Um, I think I'll just read maybe one or two more. Uh, Charlie's Angels. This is me going rogue because I did not, I don't know what I'm doing now. <laughs> uh, Charlie's Angels. Susie thinks if only she had Lucy Liu's freckles, she could be beautiful. She loved her performance in Charlie's Angels, the reboot. She now rounds corners with clasped hands, a pointer finger gun. Every Sunday mass, she prays for high cheekbones and thin face. Last Christmas, her cousin started calling her Big Head. It was because her mother had never given birth to her, she knew. She, a C-section baby, sliced out. Yes, if only her face held sharper corners, a pointed diamond, she might finally be someone, a freckled girl of someone's dreams. So there's definitely, um, I pull a lot from my own lived experiences, and there's also definitely a lot of Imagine pieces, but my cousin texted me after reading this, was like, we didn't really call you Big Head that much, like, <laughs> but it happened, so, and now it's in a book, so. <laughs> All right. What Susie Believes. Eating too much ketchup might turn you pink. Some library books have pages made from recycled toilet paper. Both hands are needed on the steering wheel. The yellow tape measure she finds from her mother's tailoring days is a Burmese python she drapes across her shoulders, a la Britney Spears. The more she thinks about her mother or father dying, the more likely it will happen. God can hear her thinking of sex during Sunday Mass. But now when she prays for her parents' safety at home, on the way to and from work, oh, but not when she prays for her parents' safety at home, on the way to and from work. The century egg her mother gifts her cannot spoil. The sparrows that fly into H Mart, perched on rafters, cannot leave. Worse than dying is disappearing. Um, I lied, I'm gonna read one more poem um, to end it on. It's the first poem that opens my collection. The body has a series of questions. What did you leave when crossing the bridge? From what materials was the bridge constructed? When did you first recoil from your mouth? Do you feel safe wrecking language? What movie theater did you travel through? What apple, face, rubber band, onion, pocket? Can you list the responsibilities of a needle? When did you lose the color green? the small fire of pennies. How did you get it back? Why did you bury the puddle? At the center of your calamity, what grows? No. The tongue diving into dark, fish sinking stone, vibrating against your torso, smoothing away the ground where the body washes away. I was running fast because of what was behind me. The bridge existed a few steps before me, then disappeared. Through wooden slats rose the sound of rainwater. I absorbed the sound until there was nothing else. Because it licked at my face, because it peeled back the sidewalk and showed me rivers of light, because I sustained injuries, because my tongue leapt at sound. A sharp eye that pierces. By the subway station, 14 red doors in the neighbor's backyard, pale and still, from a jar in the vegetable drawer, lined or unlined, embroidered in blue. That summer, I was always looking up, looking through trees, their blemished arms. The green was something inside me. It existed at certain hours when I opened myself, when everything that landed on me weighed nothing, a small leaf, green and fleshy, 
something to put in my mouth. No. It took a mallet, it took a hammer, pummel, strike, nail. It took pine, spruce, birch elm, cherry, oak, ash, soil, toil, it took. My tongue glowing pink, shivering like a lure. Thank you all. <laughs>